Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Saturday session. It will be in English because we have here two special guests. And first of them is uh, Dr. Gerald Handler from uh, Copernicus Research Center in Wroclaw, and he will speak about astroseismology, about space mission, and about how to see the interior of stars. So please. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers for having me here. Um, this is actually a double premiere for me. So this is the, my first presentation in front of any section of the Czech Astronomical Society. And um, it's the first time I'm giving a presentation that early in the morning. Um, <laughs> um, also, if English is a problem for you, um, I can talk in Polish. <laughs> <laughs> Or German. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about some um, astro seismic and exoplanet space missions, and um, this is a picture of, taken from the NASA website where they show all the famous exoplanet missions, and you um, notice that there's something missing, mainly um, non American missions, and there's actually quite a few of them. Um, so um, the first one was most. Uh, from Canada, then uh, Corot from France, Bright from uh, Poland, Austria, Canada, and Plato, uh, which will fly in the future. Um, Keops, uh, I don't have on here, um, I should say. And um, I will focus actually on two of the smaller ones, or actually those with the smallest telescopes. This is uh, Tess and Bright. Um, first of all, um, I'm interested in massive stars, and then you always get the question why are those stars interesting? And um, <clears throat> they are extremely important, basically, for the uh, generation of heavy elements in the universe. Um, massive stars actually recycle the matter. So they get um, young born as young stars, mostly open clusters and associations. They live their lives very, very quickly. Um, they lose mass through stellar winds, so they enrich into the stellar medium again with mass. Um, they explode supernovae. Um, enriching the universe's heavy elements, and with the shock wave, for instance, from a supernova explosion, they again, if they come to um, interstellar matter, they compress them and they trigger a, a, a new star formation. Um, and the cycle begins anew. And this is how um, massive stars uh, basically dominate the chemical evolution of the galaxy. And um, at the beginning, uh, of the universe, uh, there was about 76% uh, hydrogen, 24% helium, and no heavier elements. Through stellar evolution, um, today we have 71% uh, helium in some in the solar system, 27% uh, helium, 2% heavy elements, and um, this is also, of course, very important to give um, uh, material for building uh, uh, planets and also the rocket planets and uh, minor planets. Okay, um, if we look at that at the uh, table of uh, uh, periodic table of elements, basically you see the and um, <coughs> separated by which physical effects these, these elements were created. You have um, hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang, um, then you have cosmic ray fission merging, uh, then exploding massive stars. You see that basically all the heavy elements of the zirconium are um, produced in those stars. Then you have dying lower stars, where you have in the interior these, these heavy elements, exploding white dwarfs, and also um, merging neutron stars that can uh, produce uh, elements up to uranium, um, also gold and so on, um, if, you, if you remember the news about the um, gamma ray bursts recently, or last year actually already. Um, so, um, to realize or to, to understand how stars produce these heavy elements and the energy in the interior, um, we need to look on the inside the stars. Um, problem is that the stellar surfaces are not very transparent, so we only receive the, sur the, the light from the surface of the star. Um, so we have to use some indirect techniques to look in, inside the stars. And what we are doing is actually we're taking advantage of stellar pulsations. And of course many of you are uh, observers of pulsating stars, so um, you know that they are around, and this is, for instance, an animation of just a radially pulsating star. And um, these stars 
to have these oscillations, keep these oscillations, they need to have a, an excitation mechanism. This is in most stars in nature diagram, excuse me. <coughs> um, the kappa mechanism, which is um, ionization of um, hydrogen or helium or heavier elements uh, depending on the type of the star, it basically works like a heat engine, like a diesel engine. Um, but there's not only radial pulsation, there are also stars that pulsate non radially. Um, and this gives uh, rise to distortions of the surface, but also uh, because of the uh, distortions, the, the geometrical distortions, you also have temperature changes on the stellar surfaces um, that come with some, in some very well defined shapes. Um, this can be described by spherical harmonics. I'm not going to go in, in, into that, but you get a discrete but very rich spectrum of these non radial oscillations in stars. Um, and the combination and the phase shift basically between the geometric distortions and the temperature changes give a lot of rise to light changes, and that's why we can observe them. Um, and what we are doing, um, and yes, um, you also get radio velocity changes, of course, because the stellar surface is, is moving around. Um, basically, the ratio of the amplitudes of the light changes and the radio velocity changes that measure already give you an idea of the type of surface distortions you have. We're taking advantage of that. Um, that's a full like, um, uh, university lecture, how you do that, so I'm not going to talk about this. And um, the pulsations also distort the uh, stellar line profiles. And with these observables, we can actually determine what kind of oscillations these are. And then um, uh, we take advantage of the fact that different oscillations actually produce, produce into different uh, depths of the star. So um, they have a so-called cavity, and basically the characteristic frequency of those oscillations, if you know which one it is, gives you some information about the physical um, state in the region where these modes of this, of this oscillation are produced. This is very, very similar to terrestrial seismology where we measure um, Earth, uh, uh, waves of earthquakes at different measuring stations over the globe, and then we can calculate what material that wave produced through. We do the same with stars, um, obviously uh, in a more primitive way because we don't have that much information, um, but this is how it basically works. And what we're doing then is that, or uh, what we see is that different stars have actually, actually different types of these oscillations, so smaller stars have more rapid oscillations, Large, larger stars have uh, uh, more irregular variations. Uh, larger hot stars have regular variability with longer periods and so on and so on. And what we are doing is we invert mathematically that signal and compute or refine the, the stellar structure models that we have. Um, this is actually um, <coughs> basically also similar to um, ultrasonic sounding. So what's what you're doing in prenatal diagnosis and so on, um, just with uh, different techniques. Um, for that, you can already imagine we want to have like many, many, many um, oscillations observed because the more of these oscillations we see, the more information we're getting, the more uh, exactly we can uh, determine what's, uh, what the interior of the stars look like. Problem is, if you observe from the Earth, um, um, fortunately for us as humans, but unfortunately for uh, photometry, there's the Earth's atmosphere that um, um, modifies the light that we are receiving from the stars, and, if, and this is called mostly um, scintillation. Um, <coughs> the the encoding of the stars. And um, there's also um, some other effects that uh, get into our measurements, like variations in sky transparency, if you have like, different types of air or, or dustiness in the air, or if you have like, thin clouds and so on. Um, there's atmospheric extinction, which changes the light of the star as it moves on the sky. Um, the sky background may, may change when the moon rises, the moon sets, and so on. We have to get rid of all of that. Um, and this is actually um, a problem for, for photometry, to get uh, accurate photometry. And uh, a comparison that uh, actually Derek Busazi has done well, from the US is that uh, with a 0.1 second integration, with a 10 meter TPEG telescope, you get a uh, uh, 
measurement precision of about 3.4 mm magnitudes. Um, with the same integration time, with a 5 cm space telescope, you get 0.7 mm magnitudes in 0.1 seconds. So you have a telescope that's uh, 200 times smaller, and you get a precision 5 times larger. So you have a free order of magnitude improvement. Uh, and that's where you want to go to space. So um, here's just the, uh, yeah, uh, actually a, a me measurement of, of, of scintillation. Okay, and now my presentation goes completely crazy. Uh, I do not want to buy because now here it looks perfectly fine. Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't know. Um, Marek has already shown that yesterday. Um, he just had a more uh, up-to-date version uh, of that slide that um, the number of exoplanet discoveries um, had two peaks, or actually peaks due to uh, the Kepler mission, uh, two in 2014, two in 2016, when verified planets were, were released. Okay, um, that was lucky because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, okay, um, with astroseismology, um, you can also determine some basic parameters, actually, of the host stars that uh, uh, for planets. And this is also something that uh, from, came from the Kepler mission. So people have actually computed uh, um, the errors in stellar parameters they determined from this astroseismology of cooler stars. And um, they computed that on the average they can get stellar radii with uh, an accuracy of 1.1% um, masses with 3% uh, accu uh, accuracy and ages with 14% accuracies. Um, <coughs> That, of course, means that um, if you measure the planetary transit, you can also get the uh, planetary radii to a similar precision. What you cannot get is the planetary mass system and radio velocities for that. Um, but um, many of the important parameters can actually, of planets and their host stars, can be um, determined from astro-seismic investigation of the host stars. Um, now, to the small. Um, um, missions, and I would like to uh, say a few words about Bright Constellation. Um, bright Constellation is a, um, is a bright, stands for Bright Target Explorer, and this is a swarm of um, nano satellites, 20 by 20 by 20 centimeter cube satellites, so these kind of things. Um, they have about 7 kilograms, they host a 3 centimeter telescope uh, with a wide field of view, <coughs> and um, um, this is optimized for the observations of bright stars, obviously, because this is what you, what you mostly can do. And what bright does, what other space missions do not do, is uh, we're using different filter passbands. So that means um, you have also some information about temperature variation in there, because you can get color light graphs. And this is very important. And then there are three partner countries, so the, in order of um, the acquirement of funds, um, Austria started the project with Bright Austria and Unibright, then Poland uh, joined with Bright High Radio and Bright Lamb, um, and uh, then Canada joined with Bright Toronto and Bright Montreal. Unfortunately, um, Bright Montreal did not separate from the launcher. Um, it's probably still up there in the last stage of the, the launch vehicle and uh, in a very fancy um, orbit, but um, we cannot like contact with it or uh, do any measurements, so we declared that one lost. But um, still, I mean, five out of six is still good. Um, and the question is, how can such countries like Austria and Poland afford space missions? So we just compare Bright to other ones. So this is the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, real size comparison. This here is the most spacecraft. This is the, the satellite is the first um, um, space mission, astrosatic space mission from Canada. and. Um, now watch, um, here comes Bright. <laughs> so this, this is Bright. And um, if you compare um, the cost, then the Hubble Space Telescope was about two and a half billion dollars, uh, euros. Uh, most was about six million uh, euros. And uh, a Bright costs about one million. So this is affordable even for small countries, and that's why we can do that. Um, there are also some, some actually ideas of have check brights, but um, apparently this, this, for some basically political reasons, this didn't really work out, but maybe, maybe in the future. Um, just to show you how some observations of uh, bright looks like, um, this is actually the constellation of Orion. This is a bright image of Orion. 
Um, and you see, actually see, you see the belt stars here, and you see here the, uh, um, sh yeah, that, that's the shoulders and that's the legs. Yeah. And um, what we are doing is we do not download uh, the whole image because um, the bandwidth, obviously, of the small satellite, but also of our ground station is limited. So what we are doing is we are selecting fields around the stars, and we only download the images that are really around the stars that we're interested in. And that's how we can keep up with data volume. So basically, one ground, ground station can download about 50 megabytes of data a day. Um, this would be, um, this is a like 2K by 4K chip. Um, downloading and filtering images would take a whole day. So I mean, this, this is pointless, so we just uh, uh, make it efficient that way. And this is how um, the images look like. Given the very large field of here of the telescope, of course, the, the point spread functions that are distorted, but okay, I mean, you can um, make your, uh, uh, adapt your, your app photometric apertures to, that, to, to fit the point spread functions because you have your data physically there. To sit there and you can, you can always improve your photometry algorithms. And um, these are actually the 15 stars uh, in, in the Orion field observed with the blue Austrian satellite and with the red Austrian satellite. And you also see, I mean, this is always in the same panel, the same star. You see the, the point spread functions are quite different um, depending also on filter and so on. But yeah, um, one, one, one can work with that. Um, <clears throat> one thing I should add is. Um, what uh, was unexpected um, when we or when, when the mission was designed is that um, there was not very good shielding of the CCDs, and so um, being exposed to in, in, in space, the CCDs got uh, very hard radiation damage due to um, cosmic particles, and therefore um, <coughs> a CCD frame around the star now looks like this. Here you see the star, here, and so on, and up here, um, here. Um, but um, we have clever people in the team, and what they have decided to get rid of this, because I mean, obviously, I mean, if you want to do some normal photometry on here, you will not get very good data. Um, what people have figured out is that if you move the satellite just a bit back and forth between consecutive exposures, which is a technique used in infrared photometry on the ground anyway, uh, to get rid of sky background, and you look at the difference image, you see the stars again. You get rid of most of the artifacts because they are stable, but your star is moving around, and therefore you're subtracting to images and you're, you're mostly done. And, um, so even with a very badly damaged CCD, you can put photometry um, in that case. And also here you have a case where the actual nodding back and forth um, did not really work because the overlaps, uh, the PSFs in the two positions overlap. So such images are rejected by a photometry algorithm and only those ones where you get the good separated PSFs um, are being used for photometry. And this is how it can probably like work uh, for many more years. I mean, the brights have been designed for uh, nothing of two years. Um, our first ones, well, they are now between four and five years in space, it's still working. Um, and the performance is not, not that badly degrading because of the, 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 the observing techniques. So as long as uh, if nothing crashes, if nothing happens, they can, they can basically run forever because they're also, they have no consumables on board and so on. I mean, they're, they're, they're fed by solar panels and so on. I mean, uh, <coughs> there's no, um, uh, nothing that except some failure of a CCD or some, some electronic part, nothing can basically happen. Um, what we uh, observe with Bright, and this brings me back actually to the um, topic of the talk, is that um, uh, we want many bright stars in large fields or in reasonably large fields, which means that we mostly observe in the galactic plane where most of these stars are, and then in the galactic plane, this is full of young stars. Uh, which are massive, um, mostly massive stars. There's an over-representation of young massive stars in the galactic plane, and this is actually where the science of bright is actually focused on. Um, <clears throat> just an incomplete log of observations. We are trying to observe the fields for about half a year, and we're getting uh, between one and three dozens of stars in each field. And um, so far we have observed about, this number is not, 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 not up to date, but we have uh, observed about 500 individual uh, uh, of the brightest stars almost all of them that, that we can actually reach. So um, the bright, or the, the faint limit is around like fifth or five and a half magnitude. Um, 
unless you do some tricks by increasing the integration time and so on, but this only works for a couple of settlements. In any case, uh, results. Um, I'm interested in, in pulsating stars, and one of them, for instance, a very bright pulsating star is Beta Centauri. Uh, this is a massive star binary, pulsating like a uh, Beta Cephei star. And um, in a recent presentation by our uh, publication, I was meaning to say, by Andrzej Pukulski, he found 17 oscillations in that star from the bright data. And previously, there were only two oscillations from spectroscopy known, and from uh, photometry, there were no detections because Beta Centauri is minus 0.6 magnitudes. And so uh, you can imagine it's difficult to find comparison stars. So ground based um, observations are even poorer. Uh, for such very very bright stars. Um, similar story are for um, It's also a bit of safety pulsator, 10.6 solar masses. Um, 14 pulsation modes detected before uh, bright constellation. There was only one pulsation mode, uh, one oscillation uh, My favorite star, New uh, Oredani, that we have observed in intensively um, at the beginning of this uh, millennium. Um, <coughs> That's um, also a 10.6 uh, uh, solar mass star with a very rich position spectrum. And um, we also uh, increased the uh, number of uh, uh, oscillation frequencies, especially at low frequencies, um, um, intensively, because also um, periods around one day are also very, very difficult to be observed from the Earth, again, from the at atmosphere. And the satellite observations are more stable there. So we can find long periods in those stars as well. Um, <coughs> A surprise, Sigma Scorpi, also one of those stars. Uh, it's a binary 14.6 and uh, 9.5 solar masses. Um, the star classically was observed as a, with an um, amplitude of about 15 millimagnitudes relatively high, but it was later. When I looked at it again um, with an automatic telescope from the ground, the uh, oscillations, amplitudes have had collapsed to one fourth of what they were before. Um, and uh, with bright, um, this was confirmed, but also new oscillations were actually found um, because of the increased sensitivity. So, I mean, you, you see, you can you can detect oscillations about 0.2 million in touch. Um, and this is actually not our best data. Um, so, this is just, just some, 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 some average data set. Interesting things if it turns about the interior of the star. This is a not so massive star. This is uh, HD blah blah blah. Um, <coughs> Uh, 3.0 and 0 0.6 and unknown mass um, uh, triple system. Um, with the oscillations, we could actually determine the interior rotation rate of the star near the core. Um, and it turns out the interior rotation rate is about a year. Um, but with spectroscopy, of course, you can measure the surface rotation. And it turns out that the stellar surface is synchronized actually with the orbit of the uh, 0.6 solar mass companion and rotates with a period of three days. So the, stars, the star rotates 100 times slower in the interior than in the exterior. And um, the, uh, this is something unexpected from uh, uh, stellar evolution, because what we expect for those stars is that the exterior expands and the interior contracts. And so the exterior is supposed to slow down and the interior is supposed to speed up. What we see here is just the other way around. We have yet to understand that. Um, a short um, digression, not pulsating stars, but um, does everyone know what heartbeat stars are? So these are eccentric um, ellipsoidal uh, uh, binaries, so where we have uh, two stars, where one of them um, is distorted by the gravitational pull of the other one, so ellipsoidal variables. But um, if you have an eccentric orbit, then of course the um, deformation changes actually over the orbit. When the companion is far away, the tidal forces are smaller. When it's close, they are stronger. And therefore, during most of the orbit, um, you don't see much of the ellipsoidal variation. But when the stars are close together, you actually see some spectacular features in the light curves, um, depending on, um, on the exact uh, configuration of the system. So, um, these stars have been uh, discovered actually by the Kepler Space Telescope. And um, surprisingly, we also found something that was bright. This is Jota Orionis. Um, <coughs> this is a phase diagram. And here's the bright light curve. And actually, you see this heartbeat signal in here. Um, the careful observer will have noticed 
that the period that I'm quoting here is very, very close to a lunar month. Um, so one can, can, of course, get suspicious that there could be some, some, some um, um, lunar stray light or something going on. But of, of course, we also have radio velocities and they show actually a variation with the same period. So this is not that. This is actually some kind of a heartbeat signal. And this is actually the first massive star that had been uh, discovered to be a uh, member of those. Uh, of that group, and um, even better, um, if you look at that, and this is just um, frequency spectrum, if you look at those, uh, if you remove the heartbeat signal and, and look if there are some other periodicities in there, there are a couple of those, and these are actually integer multiples of the orbit. And this is a sign of that, um, that these oscillations are actually triggered by the tidal interaction of the companion. It periodically gets so to say, a gravitational hit gets distorted and then uh, um, fades out again. And because of this periodic excitation, um, you get forced oscillations in that star. So it's very interesting. And we have uh, actually more of those. Um, uh, we're still working on them. Um, very interesting is also uh, Theta Puppets, which is the brightest, uh, uh, the, sorry, most massive star that we've observed. Bright. Um, and uh, brightest. Um, spectroscopy. This is a second magnitude star, so this spectroscopy actually mostly came from the SESAR um, collaboration. Um, uh, this, this is a, a spectroscopic network in the southern hemisphere. Um, um, observers with small telescope, 20-30 centimeters, could, could, could do that. And um, this is the bright light curve, and you see some, 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 some uh, oscillations going on, not very regular. Um, and this is work by Tahina um, Ranayagamayamzola um, from Canada, now in the US. Um, if I have to mention his name again, I'll just call him Tahina. Um, and um, he uh, found that um, actually this is a change in the shape of the light curve. So this is a um, time series Fourier spectrum uh, of that star. And you see you have actually two signals in here that change in amplitude over time, which means that basically the shape of the light curve changes over time. Mm -hmm. So this can't be pulsation. Uh, it must be something else. And the only thing one can really imagine that um, uh, can actually create such a signal is uh, spots on the stellar surface. Um, because these evolve, these move around and so on, so you, can, you don't need much energy actually to move them around. Um, and this is um, um, the interpretation for that. Um, and this is basically also um, how uh, the light curve evolves with time, um, reconstructed by Tahina. These are just the uh, uh, yeah, spectra. And um, you can also invert that because you have, uh, you have simultaneous spectroscopy and you can actually uh, reconstruct basically how the um, spots look on the stellar surface. And the shape and the size of these spots suggest that these are due to uh, magnetic fields, localized magnetic fields of the star. And this is actually the first time um, that um, such uh, uh, local, uh, localized magnetic fields and the interaction with the stellar wind that I don't want to go in, in, in there have been actually observed, observationally proven. Um, people have predicted that like 20 years ago. Um, but uh, observations were never able to, 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 to confirm that. We now have the confirmation. And um, I, I remember seeing the leading theorist actually in that uh, uh, field um, in a presentation where this result was shown. And he was waiting for that for like 20 years. He, 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 he got tears in his, eyes, uh, in his eyes because he was so happy. Um, OK. Um, also, one thing that I just put, put, put in here quickly. And um, uh, because it fits to the subject, it's not an SF star, but um, we also looked at uh, planet host, Beta Victoris, the famous one, um, because this is also an oscillating star after the Scuti type. Um, <coughs> and of course, it has planets, and uh, a publication on that star was submitted just yesterday. So I'm not going to show any details because we um, have to wait what the uh, referee says on that paper. Um, but I'm just going to show you the paper uh, that did the observation. So we had uh, three years, or no, it's not four years ago, we had a short test run of about two months to see if that works at all. 
Um, and it worked nicely because beta pictures is a little bit off the galactic plane, so um, we weren't sure if we could point the satellites there. Well, um, and then uh, two years later, we got um, uh, a 220 day uh, observation because there was also predictions of the transit of the Higgs sphere of the planetary system uh, uh, among Peter Beta Pictorius who were trying to catch that, but uh, it didn't happen. Um, and then last year we got another uh, uh, half year data set, and all these data sets are discussed in this publication. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say anything one time. Um, how am I with time? Five? Okay, then I'll just say a little bit about TESS. Um, TESS is the, stands for uh, Transiting uh, Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's a NASA mission that has been launched in um, uh, April. Um, what TESS is going to do, um, this has already been, been mentioned yesterday as well, it's trying to, do, to, to look for Neptune-sized planets around brighter stars in the solar neighborhood um, to get, get a statistical basically assessment of the, 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 the occurrence of those stars and um, these are predictions, theor uh, theoretical predictions of how many planets can be found uh, uh, with tests in the solar neighborhood up to 100 parsec. Um, the black stars are actually uh, uh, planet hosts found with Kepler and the blue and gray ones found with uh, uh, ground-based techniques and so TESS is supposed to um, increase the number of known close by planets uh, um, quite a bit. Um, <coughs> Oh, an animation, so it's going to crash again. Um, I will stop this now, but TESS has this very big, uh, um, when I'm done with this slide, TESS has a very peculiar orbit. Um, TESS is actually uh, moving uh, close to the Earth and then moving out to um, the orbit of the Moon, but 90 degrees uh, shifted and 40 degrees inclination. So basically it's in resonance with the Moon orbit, and such an orbit has been found stable, um, stable um, on timescales of decades. And therefore, um, one can, when, when the satellite is, 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 is far away from the Earth, it observes. When it comes close to the Earth, you download the data. This takes only six hours because it's close, so you can dump a lot of data, and then it observes again, um, and so on and so on. And um, yeah, it also, and this is actually what the animation shows, it, took some time, some, some maneuvers to actually get it into that orbit, but with some um, um, boosts of the rocket and with little flabby and so on, they could um, get it into that orbit. And so I'm going to um, go into a normal uh, animation mode again. Okay. Um, there are four telescopes in test. They are aligned to observe strips of 24 degrees times 96 degrees on the sky. Um, and this is actually the size of one camera in comparison to a respectable human being. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so this, this is a rather small mission again. It's up in 10 centimeter telescopes. And what it does is that um, it, look, it, it looks up down to six degrees to the ecliptic plane, so that the moon and the sun and the planets don't get in the way. Um, and uh, it has uh, one camera centered around the ecliptic pole in a 24 degree field, so that means you can actually observe it all the time. And then the other fields, of course, when the satellite moves position, um, are observed for shorter times. And this is how it looks like, so you are getting some uh, fields on the sky that will, most of them will be observed for 27 days, some of them for 54 days, uh, some of them for 81 and one, and you have a continuous viewing zone, and the idea was to have this continuous viewing zone uh, aligned with the continuous viewing zone of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope tool for simultaneous observations. But JWST, of course, won't fly until, I don't know, 21, 22, or so on, so uh, it's still not really defined. Uh, first light images, uh, uh, Mark has already shown that yesterday. Um, large Magellanic Cloud, uh, small Magellanic Cloud, and so on, really beautiful. And um, again, with for Kepler, there's also an Astro Seismic uh, Science Consortium to characterize basically the, the, the planet hosts. But then people like I can also sneak in. 
And um, what we want to do is also again to do the uh, massive star science with TEDS. And these are just some of the uh, uh, science cases that we're putting forward. I'm not going to go into detail also for lack of uh, time. And I would just like to show you that um, the first um, planet discoveries of TESS are already out in the literature um, based on quickly reduced data. Um, the first data came in, in uh, I think, like July, August. Um, <clears throat> so that's one uh, star in uh, Epsilon Mense. Ah, um, oh, Pi Mense, sorry. Um, then uh, a nearby Antwerp with a star and also an, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, also Loma's uh, uh, close by star. Um, there are also some kind of, I should say, pirate um, um, publications because people have um, used data that were not uh, supposed to be for publication, have just taken them and written their own papers, and so um, the TES um, team was not happy about that. But uh, yeah, um, just a question of policy. Um, in any case, observations up to date, so TESS is observing it's the first five sectors. Um, observing sector five right now, here are the pointings. And um, I looked at it this morning at the TESS website at the uh, MIT. It's not up to date, so there's only the first four sectors still here um, on that uh, uh, plot. This is the galactic plane, so you see where these are located. This is the continuous room zone in the south. And I will just stop with a slide that um, I have actually stolen from a telecom. Um, that is the precision that TESS is uh, working on right now. Um, this is some, some observations. Um, the uh, goal was 60 ppm systematic error residual for the brightest stars. Um, the best observations go to um, 30 parts per million, and the requirement for a 10th magnitude star was 230 parts per million and the best data 200 ppm, so it's it's working quite well and we are looking very much forward to the data. The first data release, um, official data release will actually come next week, probably by the end of next week. So uh, we can wait. Thanks.